The vast majority of American scientists, as well, well as many other people as well, opposed SDI as potentially destabilizing, potentially actually leading to the very war that it was intended to avoid. 6,500 American scientists and engineers signed a petition declaring a boycott of SDI program funds, so refusing to accept money to work on SDI. This was historically unprecedented in the entire history of the Cold War. During the Manhattan Project and the Cold War, there had been individual scientists who had chosen personally not to work on weapons systems, but there had never been a wholesale organized massive boycott of any weapons program ever in the history of the United States. So this greatly disturbed the Reagan administration, and it greatly disturbed Jastrow, Seitz, and Nuremberg, who were all supporters of SDI, who began to insist not only that SDI was feasible and could be made to work technologically, which most of their colleagues disagree with, but also that it was necessary and urgent. From 1984 to 1989, Jastrow, Seitz, and Nuremberg worked to defend SDI by promoting an alarming view of Soviet strength and a frightening picture of American weakness. They wrote numerous articles. They wrote opinion pieces for newspapers. Uh, I don't have time to show you all of them, but here's my favorite. America has five years left. And that was in 1987. What happened in 1989? The Berlin Wall came down. Exactly, thank you. And the Soviet Union began to disintegrate. So we know in hindsight that this uh, these claims were highly alarmist and false, but yet at the time they were powerful and they were very influential um, in certain circles in American politics. Now, at the same time that Jastrow, Seitz, and Nuremberg were defending SDI, Seitz was also involved in another project. Namely, he was working as a consultant to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Corporation. As many of you may know, and a number of historians have written about, one of the principal strategies that the tobacco industry used to defend its product against the scientific evidence of its dangers was what we call in the book doubt mongering. That is to say, to insist that the science was unsettled, that we didn't really know the cause of cancer, there were many causes of cancer, and tobacco maybe was one, maybe it wasn't. And therefore, because the science was unsettled, it would be premature for the US government to act to regulate tobacco use or even tobacco advertising. In 1989, these two strands came together. The Cold War ended, the Soviet Union began to disintegrate, and these men who had worked on Cold War weapons and rocketry projects might have been happy. They might have felt that their work had succeeded, that the West had won the Cold War, and that science and technology had been part of that success. But they didn't. It was like old generals who can't stop fighting the last war. So instead of, and, and all of these men by now were in their 70s, so they might have retired, but they didn't. Instead, they found a new enemy. And that new enemy was what they called environmental extremism. The exaggeration of environmental threats, or their view that it was exaggerated, by people with what they considered to be a left-wing agenda. And in order to challenge this supposed enemy, they applied the tobacco strategy to insist that the science surrounding various environmental issues was unsettled. Doubt is our product, ran the infamous memo written by one tobacco industry executive in 1969, quote, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. So we call this the tobacco strategy. And we see here in 1969 this strategy being invented by the tobacco industry as a way of arguing against the facts uh, that the general public had come to understand. But what the, what the tobacco industry also realized was that for these claims to be credible, it wasn't enough for an executive of a, of a tobacco company to get up and say, well, we don't really know if the science is settled. For the claim to be credible, you needed a scientist to say that. And so one of the key strategies that Seitz had been involved with, with R.J. Reynolds, was to recruit scientists to supply the doubt. And that's what we see in our story, too. And not just about the harms of tobacco, although Seitz and also um, another scientist who I'll talk about in a moment did in fact challenge the scientific evidence of the harms of tobacco, but also challenging the scientific evidence of the reality of acid rain, the severity and causes of the ozone hole, the human causes of global warming. And then at the end of the book, we talk about a kind of revisionist attack on the scientific evidence of the harms of DDT. These physicists in our story, these scientists, denied the severity of all of these problems. 
And in every single case, we see the same pattern repeated over and over again to insist that the science was too uncertain to justify government action. To find out how they did it, you'll have to buy the book. What I want to talk about for the remainder of the, the talk is why they did it. When we first started working on these materials, when we first discovered these materials, Eric and I both had the same reaction. Why, why did they do this? Why would distinguished scientists risk their own scientific reputations to defend the tobacco industry or to challenge the work of their own colleagues, in some cases even people that they themselves hired? This story is full of ironies, and one of the ironies is that Jim Hansen was hired at Goddard by Robert Jastrow, and there are many other climate scientists who were hired by these people in the story. Moreover, all these men were very successful. They were all wealthy. Bill Nuremberg lived in La Jolla and flew a private plane. So it's not as if they needed to do this for money. So why did they do it? There isn't just one answer, of course, like all historical stories. It's complicated. There are a number of different factors. But the most important factor that we see running throughout the whole story, the factor that unifies what seem to be otherwise rather diverse and different issues, is the political ideology that George Soros has called free market fundamentalism. By that, we mean a set of beliefs that emerge out of what is sometimes referred to as modern neoliberalism, a commitment to deregulation of marketplaces, and the belief that prosperity comes primarily from releasing the so-called magic of the marketplace. It has its roots in the work of Adam Smith, the idea that the invisible hand of the marketplace is the most effective way for societies to generate uh, wealth and prosperity. But it became very, very important in the thinking of Western European and American countries um, in the 1980s during the uh, office holding of Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and Ronald Reagan here in the United States. But it has deeper intellectual roots, as I just mentioned, actually going all the way back to Adam Smith. But in the 20th century, it finds its intellectual roots in the ideology of two key thinkers, both of whom were very influential in the rise of the whole deregulatory strategies of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, namely Milton Friedman, the author of the book Capitalism and Freedom, published in 1962, at the very coldest moment of the Cold War, and before him, Friedrich Hayek, an Austrian economist who wrote a book called The Road to Serfdom, published in 1944. In Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman argued that civic freedom and economic freedom were two sides of the same coin. That civic freedom and free markets were inextricably linked because without free markets, if the governments try to control the markets, like in a socialist planned economy, the only way governments can control markets is to control the people who make up the actors in those marketplaces. And that therefore any attempt by a government to control the marketplace will inevitably and inexorably lead to a loss of political and personal freedom. And so without free markets, he argued, we're on the slippery slope to tyranny. So it's a slippery slope argument. Friedman, in his book in 1962, acknowledges his intellectual debt to Friedrich Hayek. Hayek was an Austrian economist um, who believed that he had fled Austria after the Anschluss, went to England to escape the Nazis, and was very troubled by what had happened in his native country, and very determined to try to understand why Austrians had proved so susceptible to fascism. And he blamed it not on fascism itself, but on socialism. He blamed fascism, he saw fascism as a kind of reaction against socialism. And as a consequence, he became an ardent opponent of all forms of centralized planning, not just Soviet-style communist dictatorship, but even of the more mild forms of Western European social democracy, like national health insurance and unions and nationalized railway systems, fearing that it would put us on what he called the road to serfdom. So that if we had nationalized health insurance or if the British nationalized uh, the railroads, which was one example he worried about, that it would inevitably lead sooner or later to Soviet-style dictatorship. 